Hello, and welcome back to Paleozoic PCs, where ancient computers still walk the earth. Today we're going to try to switch gears from all this Tandy 1000 coverage I've been uh, doing lately, and uh, talk about a little project I've been working on, which is to uh, build a video card inspired by the uh, display hardware of various uh, 1970s vintage computers, like the original TRS-80, uh, the Commodore PET, and uh, various video cards for kit computers, like the Altair 8800 and friends. So um, this will probably be the first of a series of these videos, because I am not finished with this yet. But uh, I have reached the point, as you can see from the demo here, that I can uh, take some pixels and sling them up on the screen. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and rearrange the camera. So we're looking down on my workbench and uh, we can talk about what's up here. So back in a second. Hello, welcome back to my workbench. Um, so what do we have here so far? Well, this as you see, I've substituted this smaller monitor for the big Commodore. It's a little hard to aim it straight up. Um, what I have going on this screen right here is basically a demo of where I am with this project so far, which is not that far along, but um, I've essentially completed the pixel output phase of this project. Now you see this these images you see cycling on the screen these are not generated by a cpu or anything running right now these are simply stored in this rom chip and the uh, display circuitry is simply cycling through um so the different video modes and using like offsetting in different areas of memory to take essentially these two static bitmaps and show different parts of them. So, uh, basically right now, you see we have a low resolution mode, which uh, we are displaying right now, and a high resolution mode. This is still a low resolution mode. In low res resolution mode, we have 256 pixels across, and the high resolution mode, this is 512 pixels across. Now, this narrower view, uh, the previous view was 600 was 64 characters across. This is 70 characters across, which is about the maximum that could fit at this dot clock. And uh, this mode, again, this is this would be 32 characters across, which as you'll see on this page, see so zero to 31. Um, and these are all, basically the video output capabilities of this are roughly in line with what you would have on a late 1970s microcomputer. Um, now most computers of that era would only do text mode, not graphics. I mean, there are exceptions. Obviously the Apple II um, was the most famous one, but there are others. And basically the, the main limitation why most computers of that era would not be able to do graphics is simply it would, it would use an unreasonable amount of RAM. Um, it actually takes the pixel output circuitry um, and how fast it needs to run is actually about the same, whether you're doing graphics or text. So anyway, um, so the inspiration of this project is I recently um, acquired an old CPM computer. It's a uh, North Star Horizon. Now, um, I will probably do some videos about repairing that, but currently repairing that is um, stalled. It's in uh, not particularly great shape. But um, the North Star Horizon is typical of what you might think of with an early, with, with a mid-1970s, business type computer which is it uses a terminal now you know a terminal terminals are things that have been around since at least the 1960s where you have you know a keyboard and a monitor that have their own control circuitry i mean 
In this case, <laughs> the monitor and the keyboard were actually connected to a thing about the size of a refrigerator. I just want to show this as a very early example because uh, <laughs> I will get this off my chest. There are certain uh, badly written uh, documentaries out there that might try to convince you that this was the first computer that someone could just sit down at a keyboard and type and have it come up on a screen. And that's not true. This is from 1976. This is not what we're talking about here. So anyway, what are the components of a terminal compared to a regular, to what we think of a video card today? So a terminal um, has memory, which uh, the display, the data that's thrown up on the display uh, is stored in this. It has to be stored in something because, of course, um, on a monitor, particularly one, you know, from the 1970s, has no memory in it. The only thing it does at any given time is there's a scan line scanning across the screen, and the instantaneous voltage at the particular point where that scan is right then, that dictates the brightness, you know, whether a pixel there is on or off. And that's all it is. It's, it's, it's history. It's not even it's not even remember. You know, the only thing that remembers it, the only memory in it is the phosphor in the tube. In the case of a CRT, um, will retain the brightness for a few milliseconds. Um, so constantly, generally 50 or 60 times a second, the memory in the terminal needs to be scanned, converted into dots, and thrown up on a screen. So a terminal will have self-contained, it'll have some, some memory, it'll have some sort of interface, like a serial or a parallel port, and um, see this board that says cursor control. This is the intelligence that when um, characters are sent from the computer it's connected to, that dictates where in memory they go, so they display where you expect them to. Now, this is a very early terminal. This is a this is actually a slightly evolved version of the one of the first terminals for that mere mortals get their hands on, um, called the TV typewriter. This is came out about a year later after Don Lon Lancaster's first version, um, and this was this was a very common terminal used on some of the very earliest personal computers. Now. The downside of a terminal is um, if you want to do anything other than just throw text up on a screen, the control circuitry here becomes more and more complicated. You know, you have to... All this would do, cursor control here, was pretty much it would remember where in a grid of uh, 64 by 16 uh, characters what character it was at and it could also, and you know, when, you, when another character came in, it would write and move forward one memory location. I think it also had primitives, so it could like advance the. Uh, when you hit a carriage return, it would go to the beginning of the next line. And it may have had a clear screen function, but that's all it did. So if you want to do anything more complicated than that, this control circuitry gets very complicated. So. Um, very early in uh, microcomputer history, starting about mid-1975, uh, one of the first computers that's often cited with having, you know, video memory, and just you flip it on and it goes, this is a machine called the Sphere. Um, they started using what's called memory mapped video where instead of having all this circuitry in the terminal to um, grab stuff and throw it up on the screen, you would instead install a card. This is one of the first ones for the Altair, which has a little bit of memory on it, and it's directly interfaced to the computer's bus. And uh, this was a revolution. You know, the, this, this is the processor tech uh, VDM1. This came out around August 1975. Um, 
there were prototype designs earlier than that. And this, with the memory directly interfaced to this computer's bus, then to write or update a character on the screen, the computer itself, the CPU, can do at its full speed whatever calculations it needs to do and just write it into the grid of memory and instantly appears on the monitor. This, some of the first video games and you know action programs uh, for personal computers were written targeting this or uh, shortly thereafter there was uh, a company called Polymorphic Systems that did their own here and uh, so the VDM here it only supported characters but you could still do a video game by moving characters around I mean uh, Commodore users in particular like the Commodore pet familiar with that but um this board also added what's called semi-graphics capabilities at least it's what trs 80s called them um where you have the normal numeric characters and then you also have uh graphics characters which you can break up in a, basically like the upper end of the character set will be these characters where uh, in this case, it was a, a two by six grid where each dot, by putting the right value in memory, could be lit up or not. And um, again, uh, many of the programs that were first written for this were modified for this to do real graphics. And then shortly after that, in uh, 1977, the original TRS-80 came out and its video circuitry was a very close copy of that polymorphic video system and uh yeah it's kind of the to my mind it's kind of the, the these cards are the definitive early memory map video systems and uh i decided since i'm doing all this work on the north star anyway i would get, see if i could go ahead and build my own video card for it that could emulate some of these early video systems, make it more interesting. And in fact, maybe um, I might even use it to emulate a whole TRS-80 because that's something people actually did with S100 machines is they would modify them into TRS-80s because they're more fun than CPM. But anyway, so that's the baseline of my project is essentially to emulate one of these. And like I said, these used a um, 64 by 16 grid of text, which um, was a very convenient format for the time because it would fit in only 1K of video memory. Um, and it actually has some advantages over, you know, there's like the 40, 40 by 24 that other computers used. The addressing circuitry is actually also a little bit simpler for the 64 by 16, which was why it was popular at the time. But anyway. So that's what I'm trying to do here. Now, um, how do you actually make this happen? Well, uh, I'm going to simply recommend, I'm going to put a link in the description for a pair of videos by a YouTuber called Ben Eater, who's uh, made a series about the world worst video card. And... I, he explains far better than I could about how it is, how you, you, you would use discrete TTL technology of the time um, to create the necessary circuitry to do the sync generation and the address generation for um, a video system. Now... Again, his, his video is very good, and I'd also recommend, if you look up, find this TRS-80 service manual, if you turn to page 13, where my daughter's dinosaur is, um, there's an excellent, oh, nope, I have it on the wrong page, wow, I fail, um, this has an excellent section starting at about page 13, about the video divider chain and how that works and between Ben's video and this you see there's a great diagram here showing you which you can relate 
to Ben's video about how different counter chips, you would interrupt them at various intervals or chain them to make that happen. Um, if you were going to make a video card with discrete 1970s technology, this would be your Bible. So, as you can probably tell from how few circuits there are on my board here, I didn't do that. So, um, the question is, what have I done so far? Well, after the 1970, early 1970, you know, mid-1970s, choose your uh, <laughs> time here, um, people started switching from complete discrete timer chains to various uh, integrated graphics chips um, that would offload at least some of that work. You know, I mean, a, a full divider chain that generates a sync and address generation, all that, that's generally going to run you at least a dozen chips, probably two dozen chips. So uh, one of the first um, chips that came out to simplify that was a chip that was called the... Um, oh, I have the sheet here somewhere. One of the first dedicated video controller chips was the, um, what's called a CRTC. And a very common was, was a Motorola 6845. This was used in many late seventies th through the eighties machines. Uh, I mean, a very well-known example would be like the IBM CGA card uses this. Now this generates all that timing. I mentioned. This doesn't actually do the pixel generation. You still need a fair amount of support circuitry to use one of these. But um, all the necessary timing where it keeps track of at what point a line starts, when it ends, when it has to generate the sync pulse, um, that's taken care of by programmable counters that are built into the, into the chip. So... Um, I thought of using one of these for my project. The problem is, of course, this is an obsolete um, piece of equipment. And, um, I mean, they are certainly still available, but it is obsolete. And it's also not the most user-friendly thing in the world. Um, and it has one big drawback for my purposes, which is... One of the things I'm hoping for is I'd like to be able to, with this video card I make, simply be able to just run the same software as one of these original machines would. Like if I stuck it in an Altair or my North Star, um, if I run programs that are targeted for that polymorphic video card, they'll just work and I could easily but then I could easily reconfigure the card if I wanted to specifically act like a TRS-80, which would change the memory mapping a little bit. I could just sort of, you know, set a jumper or whatever, and it'll be a TRS-80. Um, with this, this won't even output video until it's programmed initially. Uh, it has, you know, it's got a, a data um, register in it, actually quite a few data registers that have to be written with the initial program, which means that if you wanted to, you know, to use one of these, you need to at boot time program it. So, um, I decided instead, and this is where some people are going to scream foul. I decided to see if I can emulate the functionality of the 6845 inside of a C inside of a simple. Uh, inexpensive microcontroller. It's not a unique idea. People have done it already. But um, anyway, I looked around. You'll see that, you know, projects to do this, to generate video on small MCUs are a dime a dozen. You'll see them for PICs, uh, ABR CPUs, the, uh, the, you know, the Antel CPUs that are used in Arduino, uh, propeller, just about anything. 
So, um, now the thing about most of those is generally the video that they generate will be generated from the memory that's in the microcontroller. You know, they don't, which is cool. You just have one chip and it's spinning out a memory chip. And, um, uh, 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 it's spinning out a video signal. And, and often people take advantage of that because they do have their internal memory and they do have a serial port on them. You'll see entire projects that basically make an entire, you know, entire video terminal. You know, again, basically <laughs> the equivalent of this, but better, all on just one, one little chip. But um, I don't, well, I didn't want to do that exactly because I want to be able to use external memory because I specifically want to make this memory mapped. Um, so let me demonstrate. So I, w I looked around and decided to start because I had them. I decided to look what there was for Arduino um, MCUs and see if there was something good to start with. Now, like, if you look into it, you'll see, like, the Arduino TV out um, libraries, which produces very chunky pixels because it requires, basically requires a CPU to, like, bit bang everything, and it can only do that so fast. Um, there are more elegant systems where, you know, the CPU, I mean, this CPU is actually very well suited to this because it has some hardware timers that you can use to set up the sync. And then the only, you know, the only beam chasing you need to do is for the, each line of pixels. And it does have hardware acceleration that's good at sticking out pixels. Um, it has like an SPI generator and stuff. So uh, I found a library, a, a quick little demo. You know, one of the problems with taking someone else's code is trying to understand it. But um, here, I'm gonna shut this off. I found a little demo that a guy named David Schmeck came up with. I apologize if I am slaughtering your name. So let me unplug my dingus and plug this in. He made a little demo program. Um, he was apparently maybe going to extend this into a complete video terminal, but hadn't gotten to it yet. Um, he made a little program called Video SPI, which runs on a Arduino. And as you see, there's this neat little demo. And he can he achieved 40 columns with this demo because again he was able to use some of the uh, output acceleration circuitry on the Arduino CPU. So and this this is a simple, I'm gonna put a link to this. In the video description because it's again I think it's a very nice example of nice clean code and it's easy for someone to pick up um, basically it's got it uses a single timer interrupt to both generate both the horizontal and the vertical sync and then on each line he sets up see this line over here that's a that's an artifact of the way he's using the UART to generate the pixels on each line, there's a tight loop where it simply watches the UART to, you know, uh, UART, uh, which is a parallel to serial output. It simply watches to see when it's empty. And when it's empty, it shoves a byte of data in it, which is, um, he uses some of the flash memory to hold the character set. And then this, this is like one K's worth of frame, frame, character buffer, frame buffer that this is all stored in. And you see this, the, these graphics dots, this is what I was saying about semi graphics. These are semi graphics characters. Um, he simply on each t row across, he shoves the dots for that, you know, the characters on that row out. And then it goes to sleep, wakes up the next, uh, interval shoves dots out so this 
is what I chose as the starting point for my system. Now, uh, I use the sync code from this almost unchanged. I mean, I simplified it a little bit, um, but it's almost unchanged from this. The thing that I did differently is where this, if we take a look at this little thing, um, this simply outputs a sync signal right here on this pin. And then on this, which is one of the serial pins, it outputs the dot. So it only uses two I.O. lines on the Arduino. And then they're just mixed together with these resistors to make the composite sync signal. Instead of generating the pixel output, I still generate the sync output. Um, I'm using many more I.O. pins to basically what... Um, what that CRTC does, which has, you know, it has an address bus that it walks through based on its counters. I'm walking through um, address, you know, a, a, an address range and outputting that on the, um, on these output pins and then synchronizing that with the, um, the load signal from one of these guys, which isn't, you know, it goes into this. This is a shift register. Uh, so, so where I'm doing monochrome video with 8-bit wide character cells. So I don't need to output a character every... You know, I don't have to output a new byte every pixel. I need to output a byte every 8 pixel. So um, that gives me enough time to output, to, to, to change the address lines for the attached memory and then, you know, allow this to load. And then I got, you know, move on to the next one. So the trick was making that happen in the time available. So let's look at this for just one little bit longer. Uh, this is a 40 column screen and the pixel clock for this. Now, if, if you're unaware what the pixel clock is, a pixel clock is, you know, you talk about monitors, you'll hear about like horizontal sync and vertical sync. Horizontal sync is the time you have for a line to go across a screen with NTSC. That's about 63 and a half microseconds. Um, which is like 15 something kilohertz. And then you'll talk about vertical sync, which is basically how many frames per second you got. But then within each line, which in, you know, is 15,000, um, 15 thousandths of a second, you have the actual pixel clock, which is, um, you know, basically it's the, it's the metronome under which you stick a dot on the screen or you don't. And how fast your pixel clock is dictates how many pixels wide you can get across. Now, the standard Arduino CPU, like on this Nano here, runs at 16 megahertz. Now, the, the video output accelerator that he's using, it can run up to half the speed of the CPU so it can run at 8 megahertz and that's what it's set for here this is running this is an 8 megahertz pixel clock from here which gives you plenty to do 40 pixels but remember I wanted to do um, I wanted to do 64 bytes across, uh, 64 characters across, and there is not enough, basically this, this gives you about, you know, eight megahertz, that gives you about 500 pixel slots across in your 63 microseconds. That's not enough. I mean, I guess you could use like, say, six bit wide characters, but I'm still, the th problem with six bit wide characters is can you write a loop fast enough that the CPU can 
upgrade a, a upload a memory address every six bytes. It's very tight, but um, it became it's still. I would rather be able to do eight bit wide characters. It makes a lot of things easier and makes it more flexible. So um, any possibility of using the built in pixel generator accelerator is out. And it would be anyway, because of the way I need to generate the address line. So um, I think it's this run, this video is running a bit long. So I think in the next one, I will talk about how I evolved this to what you were seeing before, i.e., plug this back in, that, which is, you know, with the much smaller pixels and how I did it. Because um, again, you can see, let me pull this up to the camera a bit hopefully the wires don't go flying out you can see these blue lines this is the this is the microcontroller this is actually the same well it's a compatible microcontroller with what's on that arduino this is just the 40 pin package instead of the 28 pin package you can see i have many in this case it's 15 address lines, all these blue wires and all these white wires going from this to this, those are all address lines. And I will talk about, next time I will talk about how I made that work. And I will also talk about how I sped things up even a little more by using this uh, programmable generic logic chip to um, take care of a housekeeping function that um, you know, my original focus with this was just to do the 64 line mode. Um, how I use this to make it much easier to do the low resolution mode. And also um, some of the tricks, if you watch on this demo, like see this. Uh, it's saying, let's scroll around it. This is just one picture that's 320 by 320 pixels. And I'm not... It's not switching to another picture when he said when the Professor Pterodactyl says let's scroll around it. I'm simply changing some offsets so instead of so it's playing it's displaying a 256 wide window and 192 pixels tall on that larger bitmap and simply adjusting a constant so that same window moves around. Uh, without this acceleration chip here, that would be much harder to do. So, um, anyway, I, next time I will talk about that. And I will also, you know, the next phase of this is right now, this is all static information that's running off of this ROM chip. And the next step with this project is going to be interfacing a RAM chip in place of this ROM chip. We're not going to get rid of the ROM chip entirely. We're just going to move it so it's after the RAM chip and thus enable using either character mode or switch back to graphics mode. That's going to make it more complicated, but uh, hopefully we'll still make it something that I can reasonably hack together. So um, anyway, until next time, um, thank you for watching and uh, good night.